So I've been studying Venezuela for a long time. Um, back in the beginning, no one really cared very much about Venezuela. And then I got lucky with Hugo Chavez, of all things, and then all of a sudden it was the country du jour. And now I've sort of been wanting to get away from Venezuela. There's a point at which people associate your work only with one thing that's good and bad. And so I, I began to think about focusing a whole lot more in Cuba. Uh, for one thing, it's less depressing. I'm not very optimistic about Venezuela at all right now. And uh, I'm not sure whether, whether yet whether to be optimistic or pessimistic about Cuba. Um, I have been going, I first trip there with my wife and I were, was in 1978 actually, and most of the pictures I'm going to show you I did not take. I would say 80% of them, but I did take this one way back then, and it's on the Malecon. Uh, we did a little quick Q&A earlier so I could get a sense, and I think the majority of you have kind of limited, know a little bit about Cuba, but not a lot, so I apologize to those of you that are more versed in the background, but uh, the Malecon is the seawall and road that runs along the bay, and uh, I thought this kind of caught the anticipation of people, and it could have been taken, it really could have been taken a month or two ago, because Cubans are sort of looking out to sea, wondering, what's going to happen in relations with the United States, what that means for their daily lives. And that's what I've been wondering about too. So I'm gonna say one or two things before diving in the slides because PowerPoints can at times, I try not to sort of just repeat <laughs> what I'm saying on the PowerPoint, um, but I'll try to get a couple key points I wanna make before I dive into this. And that is, here's what I think I've learned from about five visits, including one for two months last year in the last three years. There are three things Cubans really want to hold on to. One is their healthcare system, right? It's unbelievable. There is a pediatrician on, in every neighborhood. There are clinics. Um, I've only gotten ill one time in Cuba. It was about a year ago. I went to a clinic. Granted, it was, for, it was the one all the foreigners go to, but it was a clinic also used by Cubans. Uh, for some reason, my insurance card, my Cuban insurance card, didn't work and I had to pay cash, for which I got later reimbursed. Um, I had the attention of a doctor. I needed a couple IVs because I'd lost a lot of fluids. Um, and I had two prescriptions and they came out and they said, oh, you're gonna have to pay cash, but here you can, and it was $100, okay, $100. And it would have been much less if I were a Cuban. So they wanna hold on to their healthcare system. The second thing I want to hold on to is their education system, right? So you, go, you can go to almost any place in Latin America, um, probably generally the post-colonial world, and you observe so many children not in school. And in Cuba, instead, what you observe are young people going and coming to school in their uniforms. Uh, they seem to be very proud, very happy. They play together. They play in the streets which I'll just come to, but you realize that the children are very well treated and doing very well. Um, and you're just not used to that in a lot of other places in the world, including in the United States, frankly, um, where the, I don't think the, acute, the education system in many places in the United States, nor the healthcare system, measures up to Cuba. And the third thing Cubans want to keep is the kind of security and sense of solidarity with one another. Those two things go together. Um, in the trip a year ago, I was, I've been there once since, I lived for two years in a section of Havana called Vedado. Vedado is a beautiful section of Havana. It's not the old Havana that you see, which is spectacular. It's kind of the middle class area, what was a middle class area, built up between 1890 or so, or 1870, I guess is when it started, up through 1950. And, um, I began to realize suddenly, as an, as an American, you live, in a very, you live a very segregated life, right? Uh, African Americans, Hispanics, we all, we, we, don't, we don't live in integrated neighborhoods. I'm starting to realize I'm in an integrated neighborhood. This is really great. People are not even thinking about black and white. Careful, I'm not saying that there's no racism in Cuba. There is. I'm not saying that darker skinned people have a harder time than lighter skinned people on the whole. That's a fact too. 
But at the same time, you're living in a neighborhood and you suddenly realize, coming from a North American point of view, that the whole city is you know, just integrated no matter where you go. Um, and that also relates to uh, the other thing that's going on there is children are in the street playing till 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, a cube, one Cuban academic told me that an anthropological study done two or three years ago showed that on a daily basis, on average, in Havana, 30 people unrelated to the family in the household pass through that household every day. Neighbors, kids, people selling things, 30 people a day. So th what I'm trying to get across is the sense of solidarity and security. Um, there's, there's at the moment very little crime in Cuba. And I say at the moment because it's slowly increasing and I have some concerns about what the future may bring. Right? So those are the three things Cubans want to keep. But at the same time, it's unmistakable that Cubans are ready for change. Right? Um, they've endured lots of hardships. It was worse in the 1990s when after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, of course they lost their economic and political patron, the former Soviet Union, and their economy collapsed. And between 1990 and 1994, the estimates are they lost approximately a quarter to a third of their gross domestic product. It's hard to measure Cuban gross domestic product. But the, the general consensus seems to be that in a four to five year period, there was a shrinkage of the Cuban economy down to three quarters of its, form, of its size around 1989. Now, in most countries in the world, this would have set off rioting. This would have set off, including Venezuela, where it actually happened, that set off uh, rioting. But in Cuba, that didn't happen. Now, some people would say, well, they've got repression. Except that one of the things you notice when you're in Cuba is that the police aren't carrying weapons. There's some places they do, tourist areas. Very rare to see police in Cuba carrying weapons. Um, I do think that there are people in these neighborhood organizations called S Committees for the Defense of the Revolution that keep track not only of whose kid is not in school or where there's abuse in the family happening, that's one thing they do, but they also watch out for people that seem to be disloyal to the regime. All right? So those things exist in Cuba as well, but I don't think that's the main reason why they got through that period. I think the main reason is there was a sense that everybody was in the same boat. There was a sense that if you had to deal with blackouts three or four times a week, so did your neighbors, and you could go to the next neighborhood, find relatives, and you could watch TV or be, even find some air conditioning, and you were all in the same boat. There weren't people, you know, there, there, I remember going to a talk in the 1990s, um, and the vice president of Cuba was supposed to be there, and he, as usual for Latin America, he was late. He shows up, he drives himself up in a Fiat, gets out of the car himself. And I thought, this would never happen in most countries in the world, right? Without security in a modest car. Now that's not to say there weren't class differences, but it is to say there wasn't that sense that there was a large, wealthy class living totally different world than everybody else, right? So that meant there was a sense of mutual sacrifice and a sense of mutual, um, uh, mutual overcoming hardship. And I think the changes that are coming that most Cubans want, there's a grave danger, and you already see it, that some of that has eroded. Okay? And I think I'll go into the slides because I can show you some of that in a, in a, in a little bit more detail. So, Partly right now what Cubans are wondering about is after Fidel. You may have seen that last week there was a party congress. Fidel gave a speech. He pretty much said, five years from now, I'm probably not going to be here. This is it. Um, my impression from talking to a lot of Cubans is that even the ones, and I would say a majority of Cubans are ready for the Castro brothers to step aside. Some of them really want them to gone and blame them for the hardships they're experiencing now. If I had a hazard, I guess, I'd say maybe 10 or 15 percent. Others just think, you know, it's time for another generation. 
You guys have been running the country since 1959. We've got a lot of problems. You don't seem to trust us, this new generation. And it's time for you to go. I think that's the largest group in the island, especially among young people. And then there's still probably 15, 20% of the population, maybe more. Certainly, I would say that goes upward of 70 or 80% of people who are, let's say, older than 60, who still see Fidel as a statesman, who still see, I mean, think of it this way. Fidel Castro really was one of the giants of the 20th century, right? There aren't many left. I don't know if there are any left, really. You know, when you think about Churchill, Roosevelt, um, the, Stalin, Mao. I mean, Fidel Castro is kind of the last of these dinosaurs, I guess you could say. And, 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 even, and, um, and I think a lot of people in Cuba, even the ones who are saying it's time for him to go, are really wondering what's next. This is the only leadership they've ever known, right? So I think, I think there's a lot of people who are waiting for Raul and Fidel and the rest of that generation the historic generation, they call them, of 1959, to step aside. But I also think that there's, there'll be a real sense of loss, even among people who, at this point, are saying you've stayed too long. So, you know, is the revolution in crisis? Well, yes. I mean, if crisis is a turning point. It's pretty clear that things already, have already changed quite a bit in Cuba. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Uh, market reforms are being implemented. They've, there's another generation, people mostly in their 50s, including the heir apparent to Fidel and Raul, who he's 55 years old. Um, there are, you know, so, so pretty clearly things can change. But the big crisis is, you know, if you want to have a great education system, if you want to have a great health care system, you need to be able to support it, right? You've got to generate more economic growth. The big Achilles heel in Cuba is the countryside. 60% of the food consumed in Cuba is imported, despite the fact that it's very rich farmland. Right? This is a country that could do much better than that. Well, now tourism. The other day, the first cruise boat arrived in Old Havana. 700 people. They all live on the boat. It's the worst kind of tourism. It is. I mean, because you don't, you don't even take a hotel room in the place that you're going to. And, you know, people get off the boat and they swarm into Old Havana, this beautiful area, area where you've got like a thousand blocks of, of buildings that date back as far as some of the, one or two in the middle of the 16th century and others uh, nothing later than about 1850. And they swarm into these areas. A lot of people are very concerned about what that means, the urban geographers in particular. Um, but what that means is that kind of a torrent of money and tourism is coming in all at one time, right? So the physical crisis, what does this mean for the city of Havana? Frankly, I don't think things should or can stay the same, but are they going to be overwhelmed? They don't have the infrastructure yet. But even if they get the infrastructure, what does that mean? Luxury hotels, hotels that cost some people $250 a night that are built since they don't have the capital themselves by foreigners. And then, get back to the food, what happens? When I was in Cuba, I admitted, I would say, okay, there's a pretty good Italian restaurant down there. I can afford to spend, this is not much for a city like Budapest or New York, I can, I can afford $14, $15, you know, to to buy a Cuban convertible currency called kook and have a really nice Italian meal. That's almost the salary, a monthly salary of some people in Cuba, right? In the equivalent of Cuban pesos. Now, again, the health care is free. The education is free. You've got to count that in. Um, an ice cream cone is the equivalent of 10 cents. A um, movie trip to the movie theater, 5 or 10 cents. So it, it's hard to really measure these things. But people, you can see the discontent. And the people who, are, who get the money from those tourists and position to get the money from those tourists, they're the ones that are going to sort of be able to rebuild their houses, maybe afford a car, right? So we go back to what I said before. Some people are going to, there's going to be winners and losers in this process. There has to be a process. And you can't sustain the kinds of social and economic gains that Cuba's made with its revolution without production. And 
We may be, maybe some of us might debate this. I wouldn't. I think, I think it's almost inevitable they're going to have to do uh, to widen the market to be able to generate the production, create the incentives to generate production. I'm going to skip a little bit on a few of these. So here's how Miami views Fidel. All right? Just another kind of Stalin or Mao figure. Um, I think it's very unfair. I think like anybody, Machiavelli, you know, talked about those who would build new states doing all your cruelties at once. And then after that, you've got to be, work to be both feared and loved. Um, after 1959, after the revolution, Batista, you know, was a horrible dictator. In the final days of the revolution, he sort of did what you see in some other parts of the world now. He bombed his own cities. Um, there were torture going on in the basements of police stations. People started pulling these people out and started killing them. Che, Fidel, Raul, and the others came in and they organized trials, right? Trials took place in soccer stadiums, well, baseball stadiums. <laughs> there were, you know, trials of these people now in front of 30,000 people, 500 were executed. Right? So we look back on that period after the revolution, I don't know how you make a moral accounting of it. But on the other hand, Cuba has never been through what Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, these other countries in Latin America or Central America has been through. Right? There, there's never been a state of siege. Um, there, I, I, there are some, I'll show you some human rights reports. There are allegations of abuses of people in prisons, and I think some of those happen. But there's, there isn't, you know, there, if you just read the human rights reports, you see that you, like every country in the world, Cuba has human rights issues. But the worst, of course, the place in Cuba where the worst human rights abuses have taken place is Guantanamo. Right? So I guess what I'm saying is that you, know, you look at Fidel's career and you go back and you say, well, my God, 500 people in the immediate aftermath of the revolution were tried in stadiums and summarily executed. How can I defend that? You know. On the other hand, I've seen much worse <laughs> right? in many parts of the world. So I leave it to you to ask questions, make judgments. And of course, this was uh, Elian Gonzalez. He was, I probably should have used this one because I, uh, I diverged too much into the story. Here's the young boy who was brought by his, uh, who, who came on a raft to Cuba and he was orphaned there and his father wanted him back in Cuba. It was a big, huge kind of controversy. The thing that's interesting is that among the things, things are changing not only in Cuba, they're changing in Miami. And they're changing in other places in the United States where there are majority Cubans. People are now going back to Cuba, people who said they would never go, people that have not seen their homes for 40 years. Why? Well, they're still not reconciled with the revolution. You wouldn't expect that. But if you're 60, 70 years old, do you say, I want to see where I grew up? I want to see where I was born. That house used to belong to me. And maybe even with this process underway, you may recover some of that property. Right? There's people that have lost little pieces of property. There are wealthy people. People left in different moments for different reasons. Some good, some not so good in my own judgment. And they're now thinking, I should go back. It's time. Not everyone. I've also run into Cubans on these trips uh, where I go to Miami, stay overnight. I talked to a cab driver and I said, he said, where are you going? Oh, I'm going back to Havana. He says, oh, I wish I could go. I said, well, why don't you go? I, I swore to my father that I would never go back to Cuba as long as the Castros were alive. So there's also that attitude. But it's clear, it's absolutely clear that Miami's view is changing. It's not so much that they like the revolution or they like the Castros. It's just that, well, we live in Miami, but this was our, this, we're really still Cubans. There's a chance for some reconciliation here. That's really important because if the U.S. is, if the U.S. Congress is ever going to lift, we call it the embargo, the Cubans call it the blockade, it has to be done by Congress. To be done by Congress is going to require political pressure, especially because despite the total disarray of the Republican Party in the United States, they probably will hang on to at least the House of Representatives and you can't lift the embargo without getting a majority vote there. But if you begin to get Cuban Americans saying, hey, we want this to be over, 
or we would like to go back and invest because I'm Cuban and I can't invest. The Mexicans can invest, the Spanish can invest, the Hungarians can invest, but I can't. You see, so, so things are beginning to change even in the Cuban diaspora. This used to be right across the street. It says, uh, uh, Mr. Imperialist, we have absolutely no fear of you. They put this up on the wall directly across the street from what was the American interest section, which is now our embassy, and that has disappeared. That is now gone. So you can't see this, ver well, I don't know how well you can see the map. So just for those of you that are unfamiliar, Havana, of course, is on the very northern side of Cuba. It's only 90 miles away from the Florida Keys, which means people will take makeshift ocean uh, sea craft and try to get to uh, the Keys, because I don't know how many of you know this, I'm sure some of you do. The United States will not allow any immigrant, <laughs> Hungarian, British, I don't care who you are, to go to the United States and get a, um, a visa that allows you to work, or even to stay permanently. You have to go through a long, arduous, difficult process, which is true in a lot of parts of the world. But there's one major exception, Cubans. The law says that if you make it to American territory, you are automatically given like a permanent equivalent of permanent resident status and you can work, right? It's such an evil law. Because it is, it's evil. Because it entices people to, to go that way. Cubans can now leave the island. Here, they, they're, they're legally, for the last, I think it's been now seven years, that they don't need to get an exit visa, but they still have to get visas like any of us do. And of course, they have to be able to afford an airline ticket which is kind of hard to get <laughs> if you're only making $25 a month. So this law, as long as it exists, for those people who want to leave, just makes it more dangerous. And so people now, the way to get in is they go to Mexico and they go up with coyotes, people who specialize in getting people across the border, Mr. Trump notwithstanding. I heard that Donald Trump said, um, I'm going to build a 10-foot high wall. And someone said, now is the time to invest in 12-foot high ladders. <laughs> so I think that here's some keys to Cuba's future. First, nationalism and anti-colonialism. I guess, I don't know how you, some of you from Eastern Europe will be able to react to this anyway. You may agree or disagree with me. But I think for many people in Eastern Europe, historically, at least in the 20th century, you worry about the, domin of that, the domination of what once was the Soviet Union, right? There's kind of a neo-colonial relationship there. For Cubans, that's the relationship to the United States. And that's e true even of Cubans who want change. There might be a handful of Cubans that don't think of the United States as some form of standing threat. Threat may be the wrong word, uh, the more formal word, of course, we use in international relations is hegemony, and they're aware of it, and it doesn't take much for the regime to be able to reinforce in their minds how much the history of the relations between Cuba and the United States, going all the way back 200, 200 years ago, when a John Quincy Adams, a man who would become president, wrote a letter saying to President Monroe, that there will come a point in history when Cuba will fall like ripe fruit, it's called the ripe fruit letter, into the laps of the, of the Americans. It's only a matter of time till Spain, which is so weak and so incapable of dealing with its own empire, they will collapse and then we will govern, we will take over Cuba. And, and there's so much else to say about US relations with Cuba. I would say that I credit Obama when he went to Cuba with being very, very astute and smart in the speech that he gave, in acknowledging at least that the United States had, had, has an unfortunate history with Cuba. I think that was a remarkable kind of admission because you know it's very hard for any American president to do that politically at home. You immediately get a, what? You're making an apology? You're saying you're sorry? It's like, 
it's ridiculous, but that's sort of the way politics works in the United States. But it really, I think, resonated in Cuba, is my suspicion. I wasn't there to hear it or to measure Cuban reaction, but acknowledging, in a sense, it would be almost like uh, Putin were to say to, let's use the Czech example, I will acknowledge that there are certain things in our history for which we have to take responsibility that were really wrong. We just don't think that's going to happen. I've already talked about this, so I'm just going to go by it, about e economics, the need for coping with the market and economic growth. Um, what are the other keys? How strong are Cuba's institutions? Uh, Cuba does have institutions. It has, any, has elected assemblies at the municipal, provincial, and state level. Um, I went to one of the neighborhood meetings where candidates were chosen, and I noticed it was mostly people over 50. There were about probably 40 people at the meeting in our neighborhood where I, where I lived for a few months. And uh, I thought, this is not a good sign for the institutions, because it used to be that you would get hundreds of people of all generations. Um, democracy. I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I hate the question I sometimes get about either the United States or Cuba, are, are they democracies? I said, well, what kind are we talking about here? I won't say Cuba's a democracy, but I think there are institutions by which the people who make the policies historically have, have at least consulted popular opinion. Mass assemblies all over the island. It's only 11 million people, so you can actually have a degree, let's not call it direct democracy, but cons consultation before decisions are made. I notice less and less of this now. But at the same time, we're dealing with a population that is literate and healthy. Let me say that one of the things that makes me a little bit optimistic is that you have a, a highly literate, healthy population 90 miles away from the biggest market in the world, national market in the world. Right? So there's, you can see possibilities for Cuba. Be, they already have a, have a pharmaceutical industry that exports patents. Uh, they have rich farmland. There's possibilities for linkage here and for economic growth. Um, so, so I, but I, I really wonder whether the institutions in the island can really, can really, are really going to consult people about what kinds of changes they want. And the, the party congress makes me a little more pessimistic. In fact, there are signs, some knowledgeable reporters, people I respect, have kind of said since the party congress that it looks like maybe Fidel, uh, excuse me, Raul wants to move faster with reforms but there seem to be hardliners that want to hold on to the power and not let things move as fast. So uh, we'll come back to human rights. And we've talked about Miami. I mean, real fast background on Cuba. So I think you all know Cuba was a Spanish colony. It was the place where gold, silver, and the riches of the Americas were brought to Havana Harbor. Because Havana Harbor, if you ever see it, it's Perfectly, it's a perfect military defense system for 18th and 19th century um, uh, harbors. And there would, then the, 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 the galleons would be escort, escorted across the Atlantic Ocean to Cadiz. Cuba was not terribly important economically in, for much of its colonial history, but it was a garrison. That's one reason when Latin Americans cast off Spanish colonialism between 1810 and 1830, Cuba was among the places that didn't cast it off. It was a military bastion. But also about that time, after the Haitian Revolution of 17, ooh, I should have kept this, was it 87 or 89? I think it was 1789, I checked that. Um, the, the slave owner, the plantation owners of Haiti flooded into Cuba. And Haiti was the biggest sugar producing country in the world. First third world revolution, I would say, was the Haitian Revolution. It's a really interesting case. Um, Cuba became the premier sugar colony in the world. Okay? The wealth that gener generated sugar exports was phenomenal. So it was a colony, but over time, in the 1800s, the United States began to move in and displace the Spanish in control of this very rich economy. And 90% by 1890, right, 60, 70 years after most Latin American countries have gotten independence, 90% of Cuba's trade is already with the United States, predominantly tobacco and sugar, right? 
This is Cuba still formally a colony of Spain, but 90% of its trade is with the United States. Now, the figure of most importance to Cuba historically, some of you remember who were here earlier, no, I asked who knows about him. This was Jose Marti. Jose Marti, some of you know the song Guantanamera, Guantanamera, right? He wrote that. He wrote a lot of other poetry. He's a man of letters. He's incredible, incredible figure to Latin Americans, far transcends Cuba. Um, he was also the leader of the last of three revolutions determined to get independence from Spain. And he went around the United States raising money in places like Tampa, Florida with the cigar makers. And Mars, Marti had lived in the United States, and this quote I have, which I'll read to you in a moment, doesn't quite do justice to his whole view because he admired a lot of things about the United States. But he was also worried. He had seen that after the American Civil War, the United States had grown as a commercial military power. And two days before he was killed in battle, he wrote a letter to a friend describing what he hoped for in Cuban independence. And he said, it is my duty to impede in a timely manner via the independence of Cuba, the expansion of the United States throughout the Antilles, the Caribbean islands, and the collapse because of this of our American native lands. Everything I have done up to now and will do is for this goal. Quietly, I have acted to prevent the annexation of our American peoples by the brutal and treacherous North that despises us. I have lived in the monster and I know its entrails. My sling is David's. Okay. Every Cuban schoolchild knows this quote. Okay. Well, here's what happened to Cuba after 1898, when at the point of winning their independence, the battleship Maine, U.S. battleship Maine, explodes in the harbor of Havana. The U.S. Congress and the press blame the Spanish. Uh, there had been a lot of press sympathetic to the Cuban rebels. So the United States, of course, goes in and says, we will make you free. And they go in, they invade Cuba, and they occupy it for three years, 1898 to 1901, and we leave Cuba but we insert in their constitution something called the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment basically gives the right to the United States to intervene anytime Cuba is facing economic troubles, a collapse, or anytime any European or other nation is threatening from the US point of view to gain influence in Cuba. So they get their independence, but with a clause that says, and by the way, the United States has a right to, in, to come back and put things in order if things are not going well. There's a whole succession of failures. First, they experience a uh, dictatorship under a man named Machado. In 1935, he's overthrown. He's overthrown in part by a group of sergeants. You know, we have military coups, you have colonels and generals, watch out when they're sergeants. The sergeants revolt, overthrows him, and a man named Batista was the leader. They put in power an intellectual named Grau San Martin, and he promises reform, change, democracy, but it's 1934 and the United States is worried about this revolution. Right? It's right on our doorstep, remember. And the American ambassador approaches Batista and makes a deal with them. They get rid of Grau San Martin. And from 1934 until 1959, either behind the scenes or in front of the scenes, Batista is in charge. He becomes, in 1952, the actual president for the second time. So he sees his full power in 52. In 53, uh, Fidel Castro organizes an attack on a military barracks called Moncada. Let's just say it fails. He's almost killed himself. He's imprisoned, put on trial, and he gives a speech called History Will Absolve Me. History Will Absolve Me says we will have democracy and we'll have social and economic change. I've always looked at the 1959 revolution as Fidel saying, social change and economic change, democracy, can I do both? Now, you might think, why not do both? In 1954, you may have heard of Guatemala. In Guatemala, a military colonel named Jacobo Arbenz had been elected president. He began a land reform. The land reform expropriated his family's own property. They also expropriated the unused lands of the United Fruit Company. He also had communists in his cabinet. The United States 
then organized in the overthrow in 1954 of the Arbenz regime. So when Fidel gets out of prison, Batista under some pressure lets him go, he goes to Mexico and he meets Che Guevara and his brother Raul is already there and they begin plotting the revolution. They know that in just in 1954, a very modest revolution, Arbenz had actually said, we're going to have a land reform that will create capitalists like rabbits. Right? So when you put yourself in that context, right? How much faith can you have in democracy? I'm not saying you made the right or the wrong decision. All I'm saying is you have to look at the, at the Cuban attitude in 1960 as, really, how much change can we make if we have what Jose Marti called the monster this close to us and with a proven record of being willing to go in and overthrow democracies in order to prevent change they don't like? Right? So think, think of it that way in terms of how the revolution unfolded. But it did, of course, 1959 was the year, and we won't go into how the revolution happened. I want to give you a sense of the economic domination because it's important in terms of understanding the agenda that the revolutionaries had. First, in 1928, the United States controlled 75% of the sugar crop, 40% as late as 1958. And sugar, 90% of Cuban foreign exchange. The U.S. owned seven of the ten largest sugar enterprises, two of the three oil refineries, and every mine on the island. Chile, uh, Chile, Cuba has uh, significant deposits of zinc, um, which, are, which are very important in world industrial development. Ninety percent of the telephones and the electrical utilities, half of the railroads, and most of the tourist facilities. So independent. This was independent Cuba. The book value of Latin America was the, by, uh, of U.S. investments in Latin America far exceeded all the rest of the investments in Latin America. So, long quote, Fidel Castro. I put this up here because it sounds so much like the Marti quote. We are defending not only, he, this was a lecture he gave about 25 years ago to high school students. We are defending not only our own honor and dignity as an independent nation, but also that of thousands of millions of people all over the third world. If Cuba falls and becomes again a colony of imperialism, there will remain not one shred of liberty for the rest of Latin America. Right? Remember Marti, and I'm working quietly because if we if we have this revolution, but the U.S. takes over, they're going to take over the rest of the hemisphere. Those who think that the only way forward is capitulation to imperialism are severely mistaken. Those in the U.S. and elsewhere who think that the Cuban people will consent to see their country reduced once more to a U.S. satellite, a land of massive unemployment, poverty, illiteracy, and prostitution, a paradise for the drambling of drug barons are seriously deluded. Only the survival of the revolution can guarantee the sovereignty and human dignity of the Cuban people. Cuba today is defending not only its own freedom, but that of the rest of the world. It's 11 million people. <laughs> right? He's asking 11 million people to defend themselves, the, not only the sovereignty of all of Latin America, but the whole world. A little bit of, a, of an exaggerated sense of importance, perhaps. But it gives you some idea of, of the relationship of Fidel to Marti. Now, the, of course, in the island, there are people that quote Marti all the time, the way Fidel does. But then, in Miami, they might like this Marti more. Marti on socialism. Socialist ideology, like so others, has two main dangers. One stems from confused and incomplete readings of foreign texts and the other from the arrogance and hidden rage of those who, in order to climb up in the world, pretend to be frantic defenders of the helpless so as to have shoulders on which to stand. Right? So you can see how they could make Fidel fit the bill. But Marti on justice. Now here's something people are also thinking about as they see the market beginning to become more and more present in their lives. We are free, but not to be evil, not to be indifferent to human suffering, not to profit from the people, from the work created and sustained through their spirit of political association, while refusing to contribute to the political state that we profit from. We must say no once more. Right? 
So you can see if you, uh, there's, there's a rich heritage here. It's a diverse one. Like any great thinker, there's plenty of contradictions, <coughs> plenty, of, plenty of text from which, you, from which you can take what you want to make your own point in the contemporary situation. But Marti is incredibly important to Cubans. I can't overestimate how important it is. Nationalism and communism. Well, the key point I want to make here is that to many Cubans, I don't know why I have the apostrophe there, don't need it, communism is a historic form in which independence took shape. They're not communists by, I, I, I've talked to young people in the Communist Party who are in kind of the youth organizations, and I'll say, have you ever read uh, Gramsci? No, who's that? Okay. Um, it's not, what it is is nationalism, it's identity, it's pride in country. And so, so, you know, ideology, as we understand it, may be important to Fidel in that generation of 59, but the ones who still think that the Communist Party is important, they join it more for patriotic reasons than anything else. Very different than Eastern European experience, obviously. I think, but. Um, I gotta skip a little bit. I don't want to, I want to make sure I have time for questions and comments. So, this, these are all recent statistics on the Dominican Republic. I chose the Dominican Republic, it's very close, Caribbean island, about the same number of people, the same time it became independent, right? And I, I just want to sort of say that even, even today, here's, these are all statistics, as no, nothing later than 2014, most of them taken from UN publications with one or two exceptions. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna let you read, can you see them in the back? Okay, so I'll let you read them. Life expectancy. Literacy, GDP per capita, it's very hard to estimate GDP in Cuba, so you probably could quarrel with that. But that's, a, I think, a pretty stunning statistic. UNDP, this one I think is telling. It's really hard to know. I, I don't know. I disagree some with this statistic. I think there's extreme, I would say, real poverty, such as you might see in Caracas today, be more like 5 or 10 percent. Um, but, okay, we'll, we'll, this particular project sh shows that emphasis, so I'll use a high estimate. And then infant mortality, right? Good indication of health. So you see what I mean about health care and education? in Cuba. Now, that's a nice comparison, but that's not the comparison Cubans make. Right? When Cubans think, how are things going on the island, they don't think about the, how things are do, going in the Dominican Republic. What they're thinking of, how are things going in my life? How do things compare to a few years ago? Are things getting better as fast as Raul said they would eight, nine years ago when he took over from his brother? And of course, they know that there are people in Miami. A lot of the young, I've talked to a lot of students. I can't say it's a study. It, I, wouldn't, I don't want to overblow, I don't want to exaggerate this, how scientific that is. But uh, at least the ones that I've had a chance to talk to and is, they're, they're kind of in a dilemma now. A lot of them have left to go to places like Spain, and then they send letters back and they say, things aren't really that great in Spain right now. I don't know if you want to come here, right? And they're here from Miami, but they still want to go. Remember, it's an island. <laughs> if you've ever lived on an island for any length of time, <laughs> it's a good, that, that, that is reason enough why you want to be able to travel, see other parts of the world. They're well educated. Okay? Um, I, my reading is that most of them want to go, but not necessarily indefinitely. They may want to see, let me see how I can do in the US or someplace, but they don't want to go to the Dominican Republic. They don't want to go to Mexico and stay there. Now that's natural, poles of attraction. We see that everywhere, you certainly have seen it here, you know, that, that there, are, there are poles of attraction in the global system. And Cubans are attracted north. Um, I've already gone through this, so I'm not gonna go back to it again. I'm sorry, I apologize, I always wanna do too much. Let's talk a little bit about human rights to end up. So what are the human, what's the human rights situation in Cuba? Uh, this is a summary from the Watch Committee's 2016. 
The Cuban government continues to repress dissent and discourage public criticism. It now relies less on long-term prison sentences to punish its critics. You may remember when Obama was there, the Obama said to Raul, take questions, take questions. And then an American reporter got up and said, why don't you free all your political prisoners? And Raul said, we don't have any, you know, tell me your name, name me your, well, he's, he's not surprisingly being disingenuous, but it is true that almost everybody who you would identify as a permanent political prisoner is out of jail, but they're rounded up, you know. They're, they're not permitted to organize, uh, uh, organize protests, for example. And uh, so, but short term, the, right now the main tool is short term arbitrary arrests of human rights defenders. Independent journalists and others have increased dramatically in recent years. Other repressive tactics employed by the government include beatings, public acts of shaming, and termination of employment. All right, that's their judgment. Frankly, I'm not, I'm not sure particularly about the beatings. I see reports. I have no reporters in Cuba, Western reporters, and they say a lot of times when people come out, we, they say, uh, the police beat me, we say, uh, show us your wounds, you know, and they don't have anything. So I suspect it happens, but you, I also suspect a certain degree of exaggeration in the media about this. But what kind of what's interesting about the short-term prison sentences, that's what happens in the United States now when we organize a demonstration. If, I guarantee you, in Cleveland or in the Democratic con Party's convention in Philadelphia, I think, is where it is, if it's like four years and eight years ago, they will set up an area two, three miles from the conference. And they will say, you can demonstrate here. And people say, well, no, we want to protest where the political action is taking place. And you go there, and what happens is the police pick you up, and they take you to a detention area, and they detain you for two or three days, and then they release you. So it's not right there in the United States, and it's not right in Cuba. All I'm pointing out is that the wonderful, you know, the human rights is, the United States is no paragon here when it comes to permitting dissent. We have more than Cuba, I, I have to say that. You know, I mean, we can, I can speak like this to, a, to an audience in the United States about the United States, and I don't have concerns about being arrested, so. I don't want to drive this point too far, but it's, it's, I was struck by this, about how much it's the way in which these days the police and the security forces control demonstrations in the United States in the same way. So that's the situation in Cuba. Colombia is, well, you know this better than anybody, and maybe my statistics, I'm a little bit concerned, this might be out of date. But uh, I, it gets about 1.4 billion a year still, I think, from the U.S. government for drug eradication. It's not that much, it's a lot. It's the biggest recipient of aid in the Western Hemisphere from the United States. And this is what America's Watch had to say about Colombia. Paramilitary killings linked to security forces, quote, were stark in their savagery. In January, for example, paramilitaries reportedly dragged 27 worshipers out of a church, riddled their bodies with bullets, that same week, authorities registered over 100 killings attributed to paramilitaries. Okay? So, I guess what I'm trying to do here is not apologize for Cuba's human rights record, but only to put it in some context. I don't know about here, but in the United States, all we get is every time somebody's rights are abused in Cuba, it's in the newspapers. Good, it should be, but this isn't. This isn't. No paramilitaries operate in Cuba. No deaths attributed directly to state violence. So let's, I'm gonna skip the other ones. You get the main point already. Uh, I've got amnesties. If anybody would like to see this, if you write me, I'd be happy to send it. I took quotes from, too much, huh? Gotta learn not to do this. I'm going right to the end, because I want you to get some time. Yeah, you see all the stuff. Okay, U.S. policy options. This has been the debate. I've only got about three or four slides left. One thing, one party says, bring down Fidel Castro through economic and political isolation, right? And that party and that faction within that party even, because that party's changing its views, 
is now kind of feeling as though they're losing, the, losing on this proposition. Yeah? The policy's failed. What does that mean when they say in the United States the policy has failed? We failed to bring down the Castros. We failed to bring down the regime. So the policy has failed, right? And then the other side, which now seems to be winning the policy battle, says, the goal ought to be to bring down Fidel and Raul Castro through trade and strengthening of civil society. And you know what? Maybe they're being successful. You can see in some ways how the opening is beginning to create circumstances which may indeed lead to exactly what they're saying. Nobody in public life generally has defended the proposition. That's not our job. Yeah. I believe Cuba needs change. I believe Cuba, I think I believe in bringing down the embargo and the blockade. I think, I think we ought to have good relations with the Cubans. They're wonderful people. There are things I don't like about their government. There are things I don't like about my government, but I just don't see how Cuba deserves to be treated by the United States the way it's been. And in particular, not our job. And that's not what our policy ought to be about. Our policy ought to be about friendship, Mutual respect, yeah, there, I don't know where the line is. I do have a line in, in my mind, I do have a line somewhere, but it's very fuzzy, about when human rights are so bad in a place that you've got to have sanctions or you've got to have some sort of policy recognizing that, well, we can't do business like normal. Cuba is not that place, okay? It's deeply flawed, so are we. So this is, in a sense, you know, a lot of the debate in the United States about Cuba is Cuba a dungeon or a paradise, and it's neither. It's a really interesting place. Have, how many people have been to Cuba? Anybody? You, you were a couple of you. Okay, so you'll you'll give me your perspectives. I think it's uh, I think it's important if you've been there the last two or three years, though, because it really is I think changed a lot. I think particularly with young people. You're younger than me, so you may have talked to more of them than I've had a chance to talk to. Um, it, it really is one of the, you know, every place in the world, people, I find that people are warm and there's something to be learned and a reason to go there. Uh, Cuba in particular is a place to go. I, I think it's important to get there and see how things are now bef before, before things change too much. Uh, let me end with the point and say, I think most of you, you're here at a place which Julia tells me is policy oriented. Latin Americans have talked a lot in the last 20 years about the concept of socialism in the 21st century. Part of the notion of socialism, socialism in the 21st century is a recognition that Eastern European communism was a dismal failure and part of the reason for that was that there was never any room for a market, many others too. Okay? And so most people who talk about socialism, socialism in the 21st century recognize that there has to be room, there has to be some, there are going to be market relations in a society. To me, the real question about Cuba's reform now is can Cuba design a reform in which the market works for society, not a reform in which the society works for the market? I have to admit, I don't exactly know how to do that. <laughs> I'd like to really have some policy prescriptions. I'd like to think through, how does Cuba do this, you know? If, if, if you're a bureaucrat in Cuba, maybe a party member, maybe not, and you're in the Ministry of Investment, and you earn a certain amount of money from foreign exchange, a certain amount of foreign exchange from tourism, let's say, and there you are, and you've got before you, asking for foreign exchange, three different petitions. One says, we need foreign exchange to provide more fertilizer and seeds for our farmers so they can be more productive and meet both the tourism market and the needs of Cubans. You say, ah, that's a good idea, right? And then you got another one that basically says, we need, more, we need the foreign exchange because Cuba has a commitment to provide free medicine for anybody who is HIV positive or has AIDS. So we need to maintain this commitment, and frankly, we need the foreign exchange for that. And the third person says, yeah, but you know, 700 people just got off the boat, and they all want to have, um, they all want to have uh, pina coladas, and they want to have mojitos, 
And uh, we don't have enough rum. We've actually got to produce some from that hated Bacardi family. They have the biggest claim. The poor Bacardi family, you know how poverty stricken they are. They have the biggest claims against the Cuban government right now because they lost, they were the biggest landowners that produced sugar for rum. So anyway, the third option is we need money to import beer, food for these restaurants, serve the tourists. Because, and that'll generate the exchange for these other things. Well, will it? So where are you going to allocate it? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the politics of scarcity. And I don't know what the right thing to do is, because I do think the tourism industry is important. I think it's important to develop. What, what makes me optimistic is, A, the levels of health and the levels of education of the people. B, the fact that the Cubans now, I think they really have a sense that, they're, that they have rights. And, and not just, and, and they have a sense they have political rights too that these decisions shouldn't just be made without consultations of them. They've got science institutes. One, uh, excuse me, nine of every 10 scientists in Latin America five years ago was a Cuban. Nine of every 10. Now, today, a lot of those people have left. The labs are old, they don't have the facilities, they, can't, they can get better work, so I don't know what the statistic is today. But it means they have intellectual talent. They don't have to be like maquilas. They don't have to be producing labor intensive, sewing pajamas and making our cell phones. No, they have, they have they're, they're, they're healthy and they're educated. So there are some structural reasons to be optimistic about the future. And I think the, big, the next big change, uh, challenge will come in 2018. Raul's supposed to step aside and make way for a new generation. Last week's party congress is not encouraging putting Fidel and most of the gerontocracy, extending them for another five years. But I think if they don't make some political openings and make some political reforms by 2018, I think you're going to see more unrest. I think you're going to see more public demands and that human rights record's going to be tested. So that seems like a good place to stop. Really, thank you. I'm, I'm pleasant, so pleasantly surprised and delighted that you all came out. Uh, to hear today and have tolerated, it's a little bit hot in this room, so. <laughs> Especially since I never wear a tie and jacket. <laughs> but for Thank you.